Welcome back. Now, for a while now, the president, once an admirer of the International Criminal Court, has become its harshest critic. To him, the ICC is a charlatan court to champion imperialistic interests. Museveni said by summoning Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta a sitting president, the ICC had despised an African Union resolution and exposed itself as being used to push the hegemonist post-colonial agenda targeting African leaders. He said, and I quote, my view is that at the next summit, African countries should review their membership of the ICC treaty. The ICC is turning out to be the value addition product that we had expected it to be. It is instead a biased instrument of post-colonial hegemony, end quote. Now, to put this into perspective, I am joined by Makere Lodon, Dr. Absinja Kabumba, who is also an international law expert. Welcome to Talk of the Nation this evening. Good evening. Today we're talking about the ICC. Mm. President Kenyatta's decision to go to the Hague as a civilian, despite President Museveni's counsel to him, mm. why would he choose this option, you think? I think um, he was being smart about it. I don't think you can refuse summons of that nature. It would, what would follow would be an international arrest warrant, which would be extremely embarrassing for him. I think he just chose the smart way out, although he tried to pretend that he's going as a civilian, he's basically going as a sitting president, the first to do so, and he said the president. He didn't want to say that president, it's embarrassing, but I think uh, he chose, I think, the less of two evils. He, pretends, he pretended to be stepping down, but you can't do that. Under the, the particular article aside in the Kenyan constitution, he was basically allowing the vice president to act as he's supposed to be. He was not mandatorily resigning his position, and so... Um, I think he was being smart, but I, I don't think, think he... Which is actually a very, very wise thing to do. Yes, but at the end of the day, he still um, uh, he responded to his summons. A lot of juristic ink has flowed in an attempt to clear the fog between domestic law and the international law. Mm. At the heart of this contestation is the dualist and monist perspective. Mm. We know that Kenya is monist while Uganda is dualist. Yeah. Is there any... Is there a possibility that this could have had an influence on Kenyatta's decision, other than him just trying to be smart? Not at all. Um, the, actually, the whole dualist um, theory, dualist monist um, dichotomy, I think, has been, I think, practice has moved beyond that. In actual practice, you find that nominally dualist countries who would need um, a sort of incorporation of treaties into their domestic law, actually at times apply them without incorporation. And on the other hand, the so-called monist countries that seem to apply international law directly also appear to require incorporation. So this whole monist dualist thing I don't think is really in keeping with the current set of international law. But that aside, I think his cooperation with ISIS, I think, is more informed by his realist assessment of his options. And I think a decision in his part that he just made more sense as a weak president to attend those summons other than being embarrassed. Okay, now municipal law, including that of Uganda, gives the president immunity against prosecution as a sitting president. Mm -hmm. And this has often conflicted with the question of supremacy mm -hmm. between municipal law and the international law. Mm -hmm. um, the extradition and trial of former Chilean president Augusto mm -hmm. Pinochet presents, seems to present mm -hmm. a dilemma. Is there a way out of this? Actually, the problem is that although our constitution in under Article 98 talks about that immunity for the president, the Rome Statute specifically excluded that immunity. And we signed the Rome Statute and have ratified it. So in essence, we have accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC. And that's why I don't agree with the president when he talks about um, that the, the idea that this is post-colonial hegemony or something of that nature. I think the fact of the matter is that we consented to certain rules. Those rules now don't seem to favor, uh, they, they seem to be coming close, about to bite. And I, I think it's more a question of, uh, to be very blunt, fear rather than high ideology. Although it's being posed in terms of ideology, I think it's a question of an attempt was made by African countries. Actually, let's say African, African heads of state to use the ICC. That attempt seems to be failing. And I think in response, this seems to be a belated attempt now to roll back the gains made by the ICC and to try now to recover some of that lost ground. So it's, it's almost like a case of trying to eat your cake and have it. I think so. In Uganda's case, for instance, the ICC, we pushed for the ICC, we referred the, the, the North Ugan, Northern Ugandan situation. At the time, the UPDF had clearly failed to bring it under control. And at the time, and this is on record, the idea was use the ICC to put pressure on Joseph Kony to come to the negotiation table. And that worked. He came to, he came, 
to, for a serious negotiation based on the fear, his fear of the ICC. So in that sense, ICC was used by the, by the state. Unfortunately, the ICC now seems to be biting closer. To it. Not in Uganda's case, because they are the, I, the then prosecutor decided that there was no complicity on the part of the UPDF at the time. And so it said not investigate that, that part of the atrocities. But the idea that the ICC is now coming close to home, Kenya and who knows what else might, yeah. might start, I think is leading to some sense of, wait a minute, what is happening here? Maybe this is the time. This thing we thought was going to, we could use it just like how domestic courts are used to deal with um, problematic political actors. This court that was apparently, th that they thought they could use, I think, now turns out to be something different, an instrument that is not as capable of, of, of such control. And I think that is a real problem, that you have a power structure outside domestic politics that cannot be bridled. But uh, this is clearly a case of double standards. We mm. cannot choose to be selective mm. about the ICC in mm. one case and not the other. Mm. So uh, it begs the question, where at the time that the ICC was being brought into the uh, mm. Joseph Kony situation, mm. was there no anticipation mm. that this mm. could actually turn around? I think there's a, uh, and there are very many instances where our, our countries don't appear to have a rational foreign policy. Um, and, uh, and, and this just recorded, I think recently the UNDP, working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I put out a call to have um, an institute for diplomatic studies here in Uganda. I think that's timely because the, f for the, the fact is for a long time you cannot ascertain a rational foreign policy of Uganda or many f African states for that matter. We seem to use ad hoc sort of responses to things and so I think it may have been a mistake that time. And there have been so many other mistakes. For instance, public statements by the president on Mijengo Island, our dispute mm -hmm. with Kenya, saying in public that the island is in Uganda and the water is in Kenya. That's, okay. that's a mistake. That's, <laughs> that is an admission in public that can be used in international law. So many cases. One of them is the Eastern Greenland case and, an, and another one is the nuclear test cases. In both those cases, statements by heads of state or a foreign minister were used against those countries whose heads of state or foreign minister have made those statements as to change the legal status of in those particular disputes. Now, if you say the island is in Uganda and the water is in Kenya, there's a problem there because there's a clear admission you've already made, a statement of fact that can be used against, against your position. You. That's a problem. Okay, the ICC has come un under criticism for playing double standards. While mm. those who use drones, like the United States, are not mm. signatories of the Rome Statute, mm. African state leaders can be held culpable. How does mm. this affect the legitimacy of the court, if at all? That's a very important word, the question of legitimacy. Because the legality of the court, I think, is clear. It's based on consent of states. We signed a number of states who are now uh, talking about the ICC, signed it and ratified it. So in terms of its legality, the ICC is on very firm footing. Its legitimacy, I think, is weaker. Now, there's the argument made by the president, I think, is a sound one. From, from a legal perspective and also from a legitimacy perspective. The problem, of course, is the messenger. But the message, I think, is a, is a good one. Because it is true that there's something fundamentally problematic about the fact that a state like the United States, which is not a part of the ICC, can still, through the United Nations Security Council, refer a state, such as happened in, this, in, the, in the Sudan case, Bashir, can still refer a, a non-party to the, to, to, the, to the ICC. I think there's just something fundamentally unfair about that. And I think from that perspective, it just displays the inherent, I think, um, illegitimacies in international law that, that really need weeding out. So in a sense, there's a fair point to be made that the world is unfair. International law is unfair. It's unfair. International relations as they are unfair. But that's the world, I think. The, in the domestic sense, certain th there's a, a clear power relation domestically in the sense that certain funds they're not put on t-shirts or others. <laughs> there's unfairness domestically. There's also unfairness internationally. And just to wind up this discussion very, very briefly. Yes. Is Africa the only place where mm -hmm. crimes against humanity are committed? No. And, and I think the ICC has, been make, has, has made a mistake clearly in terms of its... Um, it has failed in its public relations um, in terms of focusing too much on African situations. But I think they're beginning to respond to this criticism. I think the the choice of Fatou Ben Souda as the prosecutor to replace Moreno Camp, I think, is a step in the right direction. I think the, the idea to respond to the legitimacy critics, I think they have started to do that. And so I think they are coming back from a position of, um, I think they're being more sensitive to international public opinion as a good step. And I think more needs to be done. Okay, perfect point to end this discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us and talk of the Pleasure. issue tonight.
Dr. Basinja Kabumba joining us on Talk of the Nation.